the scientists of our time have defined it as thus. Sleep is a natural reoccurring state of mind and body characterized by altered consciousness. Rel relatively speaking, it is a something that inhibits the sensory activities and reduce interaction with the surroundings. And so the scientists have laid this definition for sleep. Now, my friends, what are some of the characteristics of sleep? Some of the characteristics of sleep are thus. Sleep is recognizably by its contrast opposite to that of being wake, awake. In other words, my friends, there is a contrast, a sharp contrast that exists between sleeping and being awake. Can anybody be sleeping and still be awake? <laughs> and I have known individuals that will sleepwalk, but are they awake? In fact, I want to suggest to you that sleep also, characteristic-wise, it is episodic in nature. What that means is that it is intermittent. It is cyclonic. In other words, my friends, sleep is something that you don't do all the time. You sleep for maybe eight hours and then you awake refreshed to carry on with your activities. Now, my friends, in that case, it is cyclonic. Also, I would like for you to consider the fact that it's promptly reversible. One can be awakened out of sleep. Thirdly, there is a sense of, of reduced awareness. Reduced awareness. One is not aware of his uh, present surroundings when he's asleep. There is an unconscious state to the things that are around. Thus, there is a re reduced responsiveness. In other words, the responsiveness is not there as if he was alert and up and about. Now, if you notice also, there is the motor inhibitions. One cannot readily carry out the normal toils, the normal tour, chores of the day when you're sleeping. Amen? And so we see, my friends, that we have gotten a scientific definition. We have looked at the characteristics of sleep. Now, what does the Bible say about sleep? Uh, let's go to Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. And for the benefit of those, for the benefit of time, it will be there, but I encourage us uh, to turn in our scriptures. Genesis uh, chapter 2 and verse 21. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 21. What does the Bible read? Read with me together, please. And the Lord caused what? A deep sleep. And he slept, and he took one of his rib and closed up the flesh thereof. Now, my friends, we see that this sleep was of such a nature that God could perform a surgery on Adam. He was oblivious to his surroundings. He was in an unconscious state. His motor skills was inhibited. And so we see that God could now perform this surgery and he could, from that surgery, once you read, continue to read, he could form woman. Now notice also what happened uh, to uh, Samson in the book of Judges. Judges uh, chapter uh, 16 and verse 19. And it's also, also on the screen. Judges chapter 16 and verse 19. Notice what the Bible says. And she, Delilah, made him, Samson, to sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man 
and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. Now, my friends, sleep, it is such a state that Samson, the mighty champion of Israel, that slew uh, 10,000 Philistines, that was able to overcome the army of the host of the Philistine with his strength that God had given him, was now afflicted by Delilah. And the Bible says that his strength went from him all because he fell asleep. In fact, we see that sleep is such a state that Jesus himself considers it or likens it unto death. Notice what the Bible says in John chapter 11. John the 11th chapter, uh, verse 11 through 13. Please let us read together. It says, These things saith he, after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus, what? Sleepeth. But I go that I may, what? Awaken him out of sleep. But notice what he says now, friends. Notice, it is interesting that Jesus said that he was sleeping. Notice what the disciples said. It says, Then saith his disciples, Lord, if he sleepeth, he shall what? Do well. Why? Because they knew that he was dead. Now notice what Jesus says. How be it? Jesus spake of his what? Death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking what? Sleep of rest. And so, my friends, Jesus likens this state and unto death. Now, follow with me, my friends, as we are considering this topic of the nature of sleep. And notice what the patriarch Job says. The patriarch Job liken it unto death. Also, he says, Job chapter 14, verse 12, So man lie down. And rise it not till the what? The heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. He's talking about death, my friends. And so sleep is something for us to consider carefully. For Jesus said, sleepest thou? Are we sleeping today? You know, my friends, sleep is really like that. You know, our dear Elder Moses is sleeping in the grave. There could not be another figure that God could employ to teach us about death. You know, my friends, we need not fear death because death is but a sleep for those that love the Lord. Amen. Amen. And so we are told in the book of Revelation, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Henceforth, say the Spirit, that they may what? Rest from there, and their works do follow them. Oh, my friends, it is interesting for us in this time to live for the Lord. Why? For if we live for the Lord, God forbid if we should not see him coming without death, we will die in the Lord. We will be raised again at the second coming of Jesus. Oh no, friends, I wait for that day. Many a loved ones have died in the Lord. And I'm telling you, my friends, they will awake to that voice, the voice of the archangel. They will wake, my friends, from that sleep. And so we see that sleep is likened unto death. Now, The Bible says something about sleep also. The wise man Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. He says in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 12. Notice what the Bible says about sleep. It says what? The sleep what?
But the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. Oh, my friends, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. It is something to be enjoyed, my friends. When we labor and we go to bed at night, I don't know about you, my friends, but after a hard days of work, I look forward to sleeping. And I sleep knowing that my Redeemer liveth. Amen? I'm not fearful, my friends, to go to sleep. There are some that are anxious about going to bed. They are fretful. They are concerned. They cannot even sleep. But I want to tell you, my friends, that the sleep of a laboring man, a trusting man, a man trusting in the Lord, is sweet. But notice what the Bible says, my friends. Same Solomon tells us in the scriptures, in the book of Proverbs. Let's go, dear. Proverbs chapter 6. Let's go, dear. Proverbs 6 chapter. For while the sleep of a laboring man is sweet, we are cautioned by the same man Solomon. Solomon tells us carefully in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 6, reading verse 4 through 11. And I'll ask you to read, please, as I follow along. Please read. Reading from verse 4. Beginning. Are you all there? And let us go. Verse 4. Amen. So shall thy poverty come. And so we see that the sluggard here reminds us and it shows us that there is a time for everything under the sun. You see, sleep can be a blessing, but it is inappropriate to sleep in certain instances. In fact, notice what it says also in Proverbs 20, um, verse 13 Love not sleep. Least thou come to poverty, open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with what? Bread or food. Where do we get the food from? Hmm? Question. Work. Now, if we look in the beginning, God gave man what? The garden. And he said, by the what? Sweat of your brow shall you what? You shall eat bread. And so we realize the reason why he should open his eyes and go forward is because there is a work for him to get the bread. The sluggard, on the other hand, just wants to sleep. The Bible says, so shall his poverty come. Notice what it says also in Proverbs 24. Turn with me there quickly, Proverbs 24, reading along the same lines of that sluggard and having a feel and how he should make use of it. Notice what it says, Proverbs 24, reading from verse 30. Notice what the Bible says here. It says, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles and covered the face thereof. And the stones of the wall was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. And I looked upon it and received instructions. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want 
as an amen. And so the reason why, my friends, notice with me carefully, the reason why the sluggard will come to poverty, why, my friends, for while he's sleeping, there is no time for him to tend to the field so that he can make bread. And so, my friends, he will literally come to poverty. He will not have a means to sustain himself nor his family. And so there is a time, my friends. Sleep of the laborer man is sweet. But not so much for the sluggard. Oh, my friends, it is interesting that there is a time to sleep but the time is not when the watchman is on the wall. The time is not when the watchman is on the wall, my friends. Can you imagine a watchman sleeping on the wall? I know you cannot see the picture clearly, but notice there is an army that is coming, and this is the watchman. He's sleeping on the wall. The book of Ezekiel tells us clearly, watchman, if he should blow the trumpet, if he should make a certain sound to warn the people, then I want to tell him, my friends, that the blood of the people will not be on his shoulder. But if he warn them not, he shall surely uh, perish, and the blood of the people shall be required of him. Yea, I want to say to you this much, that the blood of his own soul will be required of him. Here is a time to sleep, my friends. But there is a time when sleeping can be detrimental. You see, a lot is at stake at times, my friends. We cannot be awake and be asleep at the same time. And so as Christians, we have to be vigilant. We have to be watchful. We have to be sober. Knowing that the adversary, the devil is on our tails. And I want to tell you this much, friends. He neither sleeps nor slumber. And so can you imagine when the disciples were there? Jesus, in a moment of anguish, in a critical moment of earth's history, when the destiny of souls were hanging in the balance, when Jesus was about to pour out his soul, he came looking for some encouragement. He came to prayer night meeting. And he found those that should be praying, not only for him, but for themselves, sleeping. The question, therefore, is what is the implication of that phrase, sleepest thou. Let's turn quickly in our Bibles to our scripture reading. Mark chapter 14. And let's see what we can gather from this passage of text. Mark chapter 14. Mark, the 14th chapter, reading um, from verse 32. Notice what the Bible says. <clears throat> In Mark, chapter 14, verse 32. It says, And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. Verse 33. And he take it with him Peter, James, and John. And began to be sore amazed. That word there, amazed, in the original, it actually means he began to be affrighted. Afraid, my friends, almost. And to be very heavy, a sorrow, my friends, a deepened sorrow fell on the Son of God. In fact, notice what he says in verse 34, because he states it. He says, and he said unto them, my soul is exceeding 
sorrowful unto death, tarry he here and watch. That word watch means to stay awake. So Jesus told them, listen, my soul, can you imagine please with me for a moment? You are the disciples, you are there with the master. You know that this is the one that you look for, the Messiah. The one upon whom the center of the Jewish economy uh, was builded upon. He was here. He was the master, my friends. You were in this special movement. And as a result, Jesus now is expressing to you, never before was Jesus so sorrowful. And he's saying to you literally, my soul is sorrowful exceedingly unto death. Question for you. If you were in that situation, would you sleep in a moment like that? Question. My friends, there are times... You know, this can come in no comparison to our situation. The Son of God was taking upon him the sins of the world, my friends. He was burdened down with your guilt, with my guilt. He was fulfilling his Father's wishes to a T. Jesus was taking, he was becoming uh, the substitute and surety. Just as in time of old, when the sins of the people were transferred on the head of that lamb, Jesus was now the Lamb of God. And he now was about to take on the blame, the shame, everything that was associated with sin, he was going to take it on, the guilt. And he was burdened down, my friends. Would you sleep in an hour like that? If Jesus was depending on you and he said, please watch with me, would you sleep? In fact, Jesus went further. Verse 35, he says, And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. My friends, it was so burdensome on Jesus that even though he was willing, he was seeking away, my friends, the human frailty of Jesus was under a supernatural pressure. And I want to tell you, the sinner will feel that, my friends. If he does not come to a, a, a dependent, saving relationship, may Jesus is all. In fact, if you notice what he says also, he prayed now, my friends, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me, nevertheless, not what I will. But as thou wilt. And so can you imagine Jesus praying this prayer? His disciples not far from him. Do you think? I ask you, I want to ask you a question. First, I asked you whether or not you would sleep. And the reason why I asked you is because I want to ask you whether or not the disciples were planning on sleeping when Jesus asked them that when Jesus expressed to them the condition that he was facing. Now, the second question I want to ask you is, do you think they heard his prayers? Notice, my friends, he was just a little way from them, and he was praying. I can assure you, my friends, he was never their intent to sleep. In fact, if Jesus was depending on any of us here, it would never be our intent to sleep. Oh, my friends, they heard those groanings. Desire of Ages tells us that when they heard those groanings, they 
they, they, the first response was them to run to Jesus. But he had said, tarry here. They had been grievously concerned with what was taking place with their master. In fact, we are told in the book Desire of Ages, under the chapter Gethsemane, that just before getting to the garden, twice Jesus would have fallen to the ground. And they had to support him, my friends. They were actually relieved when he got to the place of rest. Where he could now pray, he, we are told that he often went there to that garden to pray. But never before was he so heavy. Never before such a sorrow was placed upon him. It was never their intent to sleep. They heard his cry, my friends. And as a result, Jesus prayed. And after he prayed, we are told here, verse 37, and he cometh and find them sleeping. And said unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldest not thou watch one, not even an hour, my friends. They could not even keep up an hour, my friends. Now Jesus says something. Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. What is the implication of the text? Was it that they had planned to sleep? No. The implication as Jesus came to them and said, sleepest thou. The implication is that there was a spiritual battle going on. Notice what Jesus says in verse 38. It sheds clear light on the subject. He says, watch ye and pray. Lest ye enter into temptation. And so really and truly, Jesus knew that his disciples, he was about to die. And his disciples now would have to stand on their faith. And he wanted them, my friends, to be in a place. He wanted to be comforted by the fact to know that they were not only praying for him, but they were praying for themselves. But Jesus gave them divine prescription. He said, watch ye and pray. Be awake and pray. And so no wonder, my friends, Satan does not want us to pray. The only reason why they found themselves sleeping is because they weren't praying. Now, when we are talking about temptation, Jesus, we know that God does not tempt man. We find that in the book of James, right? Amen? But Satan will surely tempt us. And so there was something going on behind the scenes, the implication that, the, that there was something behind the scenes that Jesus was preparing them for. He saw what would take place. He knew, my friends, that this event that was supposed to take place, him being taken to the cross to die for their sins, it would shake their world. And they would have to be in a position where their faith is looking unto God and depending upon him totally. And so we read in the book Desire of Ages what really took place. Desire of Ages, page 688, paragraph 1. Notice what the prophet says. Desire of Ages, uh, page 688, paragraph 1. Raising with painful effort, speaking of Jesus, he staggered to the place where he had left his companion. But he findeth them asleep. Had he found them praying, he would have been relieved 
had they been seeking refuge in God. Notice this, my friends. Please notice this, please. That satanic agencies might not prevail over them. Do you get that, my friends? This was not just a physical sleep. Get what I'm saying, my friends. This was supernatural. In an hour when they would not have normally slept, just for one hour, my friends, they found themselves sleeping. In other words, the implication of the text is that it's not so much sleep as thou in terms of physical, but the disciples spiritually were sleeping. Now follow me, friends. Notice what the, Bible, notice what the Spirit of Prophecy says. It says, He would have been comforted by their steadfast faith. But they had not heeded the repeated warnings. Watch and pray. At first, they had been much troubled to see their master, usually so calm and dignified, wrestling with a sorrow that would be on comprehension. They had prayed as they heard the strong cries of the sufferer. They did not intend to forsake their Lord, but they seem what? Paralyzed by a stupor which they might have shaken off if they had continued pleading with God. They did not realize the what? They did not realize the what? They did not realize the what? Necessity of what? Watchfulness an earnest prayer in order to withstand temptation. My friends, let me tell you something. Satan knows that if we are continuing in prayer, that he can never overcome us. Jesus gives the, the remedy, the secret to success. My friends, prayer to the Christian is the lifeblood of it is the breath of the soul. And truly, we cannot live as Christians without prayer. And so, friends, no wonder we are told in the book Great Controversy that Satan, my friends, you see, Satan knows that he can overcome those who neglect, neglect prayer and searching of the scriptures. Therefore, my friends, he invent every possible device to engross our minds. When we should be praying, my friends, oh Lord, have mercy upon me. When we should be agonizing, my friends, we are told, my friends, that if you want to check the temperature of the church, check the prayer meetings. And if we don't have time to pray, if we don't have time to have family worship, oh my friends, I want to tell you, we are sleeping. Notice what the prophet continues to say. Go forward. Notice what she says in that book, uh, a medical uh, uh, missionary, page 93-6, uh, paragraph 6. It says, let us put on every piece of the Christian's armor and steadfastly resist the enemy. We shall have to meet with fallen angels. Do you get that, my friends? And the prince of the powers of darkness. Satan is by no means asleep. He is wide awake, my friends. And is playing the game of life for souls of, people, of the people of God. He will come to them with flattery of all kinds. In the hope to lead them to swerve. From their allegiance, he desires to call their attention from the what? The real issue to the false theories. My friends, what's the real issue? The real issue is that we are in a state of slumber. We are spiritually sleeping, my friends. And as a result, the antidote is to watch and pray. But we are not watching and praying as we should. And so we are in a state of sleep. Jesus said, sleepest thou. The 
Question therefore now. As we examine our last point. What are the practical applications for us? What are the practical applications for us? My friends, I want to tell you this much. That Jesus is in the heavenly sanctuary. In fact, grab your Bibles with me. And let's go to the book of Hebrews. In fact, before we go to Hebrews, let's, let's go to Daniel. Let's go to Daniel. Daniel chapter 12. Let's go to the book of Daniel. Oh, my friends, now is not the time for us to be sleeping spiritually. Now is the time for us to be awakened because Jesus is soon to come. And while we are sleeping, while we are carrying on with business as usual, Jesus is soon to come. We are told in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, it says, And at that time, who shall what? Michael, stand up. Who is Michael? Michael is Jesus, my friends. If you notice, I don't have time to go there right now, but just jot these texts down. Jude, Jude tells us that Michael is the archangel. And when you go back to Thessalonians 4, it tells us that the dead is raised by the, arch, the voice of the archangel. And only one person, my friends, has the power to raise the dead, and that is Jesus. We saw that earlier, my friends. We saw when he called for Lazarus um, from the dead in the book of John chapter 11. And so really, Jesus is Michael. In fact, he's considered Michael. When you look at the word Michael, is one that is like God. And the archangel, it means the chief of the angel. So one that is like God and is the chief of the angel and is able to raise the dead. And that one is Jesus, my friends. Now notice what the Bible says. It says, at that time shall Michael stand up. Now we know what stand up means. Amen? We know that in the book of Daniel, when someone stands up, it means they are about to rule. Amen? Amen? So it means, therefore, that if he stands up, he was sitting down before. Amen? So turn with me quickly to the book of Hebrews. Go with me quickly. For when Michael stands up, something shall happen. There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since. Hebrews. Go with me quickly to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. In fact, you know what? Before we go to Hebrews chapter 12... Uh, let's go to Hebrews chapter 8. Let's see if Jesus, which is Michael, is in the heavenly sanctuary. Notice what it says, my friends. Oh, my friends, now is not the time to play with our salvation. Now we cannot be asleep at this moment. Oh, my friends, I, let me tell you something. You see, if never before, when that runner is on that track and he sees a finish line before him, now is not the time, my friends. To consider the pain, the fact that he is weary, all he has in focus is the finish line. Oh, my friends, let me tell you something. When someone is running a race, they cannot look to the side nor to the back. They have to keep their eyes focused, my friends. In fact, uh, when we read it carefully, I know I told you to go to Hebrews 8, but when you go to Hebrews 12 and verse 2, it says, looking unto Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. And so we see that Jesus is now sitting down at the right hand of the throne of God. But notice what Hebrews uh, chapter 8 says, zeroing down on verse 1. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. It says, Now... Of the things we have spoken, this is a psalm. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the, of the what? Of the majesty in heaven, my friends. This is not a sanctuary on earth. Though there was a sanctuary, it was pointing ultimately to the sanctuary above where Jesus being the Lamb of God and the intercessor, the high priest, would be eventually finishing his last phase of ministry. 
Oh, my friends, Jesus, when he died on Calvary's cross, went there not just, just to play games, my friends, not just to receive the adoration of the angels, though he was worthy, but he went there for you and for me. What did he went there to do as he was sitting? For we know the sitting position signifies something. For if when he stands, he comes to rule, meaning that he sees whatever he's doing, it means that when he's sitting, he's doing something. Now follow with me quickly. Same chapter. Let's go to verse 6. It says, but now he has obtained a more what? Excellent ministry. By how much also he is what? The mediator. So in other words, Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant. He's there and he's interceding for me and for you. But I want to tell you, Michael will not always stay there. We are told in the book of Daniel, we read it a while ago, Michael shall stand, my friends, at that time. What time? That's another subject for another time. Amen? But at that time, Michael shall stand up. We know, my friends, that that time must be probation closing. Because if Jesus will cease his intercession... It means there is no more hope for the sinner. So now if Jesus is in a holy place, a most holy place, interceding for me and for you, there is coming a time when he will stand. You know, Satan doesn't mind for us to sleep. You know why? He knows that if he can get us to continue to sleep, then time will progress because Michael will not always be there. We are told that at some given point, he will stand and probation will close. In fact, I want to tell you this much. That's the reason why in the book of Acts, go with me quickly. Book of Acts, Acts uh, chapter 7. Acts the 7 chapter. I hope you brought your Bibles, amen? Amen, amen. amen. Acts chapter 7. And let's zero down quickly. On verse 56. After Stephen had given them his final benediction, he had broken down the fact that throughout the ages it had pointed Jesus being the Son of God, the one that would be crucified, the one that would pay the penalty, be the ransom on man's behalf. Afterwards, Stephen makes his proclamation, verse, uh, uh, let's read from verse 54. It says, when they heard these things, this is talking about the Jewish leaders and those that were present around Stephen. It says now, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They gnashed their teeth on him. They gnashed, sorry, on him. With their teeth, but he being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfast into the heaven. Where did he look? Into the heaven. And saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Notice, my friends, he saw Jesus what? Standing. And behold, saith, behold, I, and he's telling them now, I see the heaven open, and behold, the Son of Man standing on the right hand. And no wonder they rushed upon him and stoned him. You know why, my friends? Because it meant that their probation was closed. And we know based on prophecy, we know, my friends, 70 weeks was given to the Jewish nation based on the book of Daniel chapter uh, 9 and verse 24 onward. 70 week was given to them and it culminated right on time. And so we see, my friends, that Michael stood up then and he's going to stand up for another time. And when he stands, probation will be closed, not only for the Jews, but I want to tell you this much. It will be closed for the world. And I want to make a disclosure, my friends. I do believe while probation closed for them as a Jewish nation, still there is hope if they'll believe in Jesus Christ. They are not saved as a nation. In fact, they were never saved as a nation. I want to tell you that much. Because on the Day of Atonement, every man had to afflict his soul. And if there was a man 
found that did not afflict his soul, he was what? Cut off that individual. But they were no longer the favored people and God had to raise up a people in the hour of judgment, an hour that Jesus is in the heavenly sanctuary and about to seize his work to give a special message. Oh, my friends, we are living in the last days. We are living in the seventh church, the last church. What more could Jesus have done that has not already been done? And he's warning us before that he's soon to stand. And so, my friends, I want to tell you this much. That while Jesus is in the most holy place, if we are praying and agonizing, didn't, that, didn't, didn't the Bible say that? Yes. Didn't it say that those that will be sealed, those that will stand the test of time, are those that are crying and sighing for the abominations? Yes. They are pleading, they are praying with God as never before, friends. They are having an experience like that of Jacob. Jacob was wrestling and he would not until the angel blessed him. And I'm telling you, my friends, if we are going to make it, we are going to have to press. Amen. Now, my friends, follow with me, my friends. Before I went over the characteristics of sleep, I want to tell you, Jesus came to his disciples in such an hour. Oh, my friends, we are at the last of everything. We're in the sixth seal. Oh, my friends, we are at the last. The next great event is the coming of Jesus Christ. Let me paint a picture to you. You see, Jesus was in the garden interceding. Yes, we know he was interceding for himself, but notice carefully, the Bible says, could not thou watch with me for one hour? Do you think Jesus was just there praying repetitively and asking the Lord to let the, the cup be passed from him within that hour? No, my friends. Once he prayed, he was also praying for his disciples. That's why we find John 17. When you follow the chronology, they had left the supper and they had gone there, my friends. Jesus' prayer in John 17 was recorded there, friends, because Jesus was praying for us and for them, not only for himself. And so, my friends, Jesus was interceding in the garden. His disciples was waiting for him to come back. Are we seeing the application? Jesus is in the most holy place. He's interceding. We are waiting for him to come back. But I want to tell you the difference, my friends. If Jesus comes this time and finds us asleep, you know what will happen, my friends? He's not going to go to the cross for us. We will have to take our burden and our guilt and our shame and the sin which we did not want to let go. Oh, my friends, he will, he will drown us, my friends. Jesus went through it for me and for you. Why? So that we don't have to go through it. But he's coming again, my friends. The Bible says that at that time, Michael will stand up. And shortly thereafter, my friends, he will come. I'm telling you, my friends, woe be unto the man at that point that is without an intercession. He is going to pray, my friends. Let the rocks fall on us. Oh, my friends, let me tell you this much. We are told that Adventists, amen, Adventists will have the greatest squeal. Why, friends? I'm going to tell you why. You know, some people say we do not know. You think Adventists won't know when the plagues are falling that it's too late? You think we, we won't know when there's an enforcement of a national son in law that is too late? Oh, yes, we will know, my friends. But it will be too late for some of us. It will be too late, my friends. And so, my friends, Jesus is saying, sleepest thou. Remember, we saw the implication that the sleepest thou is a spiritual one because there are satanic agencies, not just. It's not just me wrestling against one another I want to sleep. There is a living devil and he's wrought. Because you know what, my friends? While we don't know that we have a short time, Satan knows that. He says, the Bible says, Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. Right, my friends? 
For the devil is come down, knowing that he hath but a short time. Now, my friends, let's make some quick application and let's wrap up. Notice, epis, 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 episodic. Amen, amen, amen. Cyclonic or intermittent. You want to know if you are really sleeping, sleeping spiritually? Do you have a spasmodic, cyclonic, or intermittent relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you just an Adventist or a Christian on Sabbath? But when you go in the week, nobody can tell that you're a Christian. The music that you listen is just like the world. The clothes you wear is just like the world. The way we behave is just like the world. The things we watch is just like the world. And let me tell you some friends, oh Lord of mercy. Do you know that angels are being record, my friends? Be careful of what, you know, they have a, a song that young people sing. It says, watch your eyes, watch your eyes, what you see. For there is a what? A father looking down. And my friends, may I, I'm telling you, he's looking down with tender love because his heart is grieved. That his children is watching something that they should not be watching. Amen. Oh, my friends, if you want to know if you are sleeping, my friends, you have an intermittent relationship. You don't pray as you should. You can't afford to come to, to Permian, but you don't come. You can't be here at power, but you don't come. You want to know if you're sleeping, my friends? It is it's an intermittent affair. My friends, you cannot, note, cannot be awake and sleep at the same time. I want to submit to you that everybody in this audience, within the year of my voice, and those that are watching, you're fi you find yourself in one category or the next. It's either you are awake spiritually or you are asleep spiritually. And so if your relationship is spasmodic, if you're just one day Christian, as they say, only when it fits the part, you're only willing to go when the crowd is there. When you have support, you have a lean to religion. When others are there with you, you don't mind going hedge, ditch, and steeple just to get forward. When nobody is there in your quiet hour, how are you in your family circle? How do you treat each other? Is it a constant Christian experience or is it intermediate? You want to know if you're sleeping spiritually? There's a reduced awareness. A reduced awareness. You're not aware of the time in which you're living in. You're not aware that we are right on the brinks that Michael is about to stand. Oh, my friends, you want to know whether or not you, you really are aware or not? You see, if you were aware, you wouldn't love the sin you do so much. Oh, my friends, we love sin more than we love the Savior. And I want to tell you, there is hope for such a one. Oh, I do believe. I don't want to come and tell you it's all doom and gloom. Jesus gave the remedy. He said, watch and pray. If we pray, my friends, I don't care what your temptation is. I don't care what your circumstances. God can raise you up. It can allow you to live again. We are told that what the church needs the most is a revival and reformation. And this can only come through prayer. So we're not aware of our surroundings. There is a reduced responsiveness. Oh, my friends, this one is critical. You know, there is a time... Oh, my friends, I tell you something. I pray that none of us will grieve the Holy Spirit. But if you notice, there was a time when our heart was very soft. Oh, we would come to tears when the minister or someone said something along the lines of bringing us conviction or when we read something. Now, you know what? You want to know if you're sleeping? You're not moved anymore. When you read the scripture, it doesn't come home to your heart. When, when, when the preacher is, pre and you know the Bible says the foolishness of preaching. This is foolishness, my friends. Why? 
Because we can never do anything to convict the heart, but the Holy Spirit can. And let me tell you something. When we get to the point where not even the Holy Spirit can move hearts, we are less sensitive, my friends. We are less responsive to the call. And now I'm telling you something. These ministers nowadays have to be laboring because you know what? They stand between the living and the dead. They have to be laboring and saying, please come forward. Please, in the name of Jesus. Let me tell you something. If heaven, you know, we really don't appreciate the, 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 the energies expended by heaven. All the heaven, heavenly hosts, the angelic hosts, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit has cooperated so that we can be saved. All we have to do is avail ourselves, my friends. The motor skills is inhibited. We don't, you don't want to know if you're sleeping, my friends? What's your missionary life like? Are you doing work for the Lord? When you're on the job, what's your real purpose for being on the job? What's your first calling? Is your job a vocation or are you really just on the job just to do the job? Is it a means to an end? Are you an ambassador for Jesus Christ? But your vocation, your trade is what sustains what you have been called to do, which is be an ambassador? Oh, my friends, if you are spiritually sleeping, you cannot awaken others because you yourself need to be awakened. And so you cannot tell others about the soon coming of Jesus Christ. You cannot, with the zeal that you used to, have you lost your zeal to tell others about the soon coming of Jesus? It may just be, like the disciples of old, that Jesus is saying, sleepest thou. But I want to close on this note. If you notice the last one on there, it says, promptly reversible. Amen, church. I want to tell you that Jesus can do something special for you. He can awaken you, my friends. We are told that as many as he loves, he rebukes and chastens. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Revelation 3.19. And so there is a work for us to do. And that work is a work of repentance. We need to repent, my friends. We need to organize with God as never before. Oh, my friends, Jesus is soon to come. And I want to tell you this much. That when he comes, I'm telling you, my friends, is either we are in a state of readiness or we are sleeping. It doesn't be that anybody in this audience have to be asleep when Jesus comes. I'm telling you this much. Satan, the adversary of our souls, would seek to discourage us. He would allow us to look at our circumstance and say, I have gone too far. I admit that I have been sleeping. I don't have devotion anymore. I'm so busy. I don't have time to spend with Jesus to pray. No time to come to prayer meeting. Lord have mercy upon us. For we have all sinned. No time anymore, my friends. To truly consider our position. In mercy today, God is saying to somebody today in this place. If you are asleep, there is hope. I want to tell you, my friends. You may say in your heart that you don't understand. I've been struggling for a long time. I know what is the truth. But I keep finding myself going back 
to what I should not be doing. I want to tell you the truth, my friends. You are sleeping. You see, the person that is sleeping cannot recognize that they are sleeping in a state of sleep. But I'm here to tell you that you can live again. You can be revived again. And my friends, in the book of Revelation, Jesus said, is either your heart or cold. Let me tell you something. Jesus prefer for you to be fully in the world. Or fully for him. There's no in between. In between is dangerous. To be lukewarm bring relaxation. And relaxation can put us in a slumber. And Jesus said, listen to me, I cannot pray for you anymore. I have to spew your request out of my mouth. So in the quietness of this hour, I want to make a special appeal. Maybe God spoke to your heart. And you want to say, Lord, please help me. That I will arise out of this sleep. That I'll be on fire for you. That I'll have a steady, a steady Christian experience. Not an intermittent one. That I'll be aware of the time in which I'm living. I'll be watchful. I'll be prayerful. I'll be responsive to your Holy Spirit. And that you can use me to finish this work. Oh, my friends, Jesus is soon to come. And if he's soon to come, you don't have to sleep, my friends. You can be there to hail him as Lord and Savior. If that is your desire, please stand with me to your feet.